Welcome to our webinar on native plants and gardening. We're delighted to have um, Monica Buckley as our speaker. Monica is um, the principal of Red Stem Native Landscape, a very uh, popular native landscape design company on the North Shore of Chicago. Red Stem designs, builds, and maintains native plant gardens for the delight of their owners and the sustenance of wildlife. Native plant roots sequester carbon, protect our waterways by absorbing and cleansing water, and support our butterflies and moths, native bees, and birds with food, shelter, and the chemical compounds they evolve with and require for optimum health. During our program tonight, Monica will take us through the design and evolution of one suburban Chicago yard, from lawn to native plant paradise. After the presentation, Monica will answer questions, um, but she does want you to know that it's gonna be very hard. She won't be able to diagnose your specific plant problems, but um, she encourages you to reach out to professionals to get the help um, that you need in for very specific issues with your plants. She'll be open to all kinds of questions. And then when um, after that Q and A, we're going to um, introduce you all to Nancy Papkovich. She's a Go Green Moment board member, and she's the co-chair of the Go Green Moment Native Plant Sale, which again is this Saturday at Gilson Park Swim Beach. And she'll be available to answer your specific questions about the sale. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Monica and um, thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Monica. Thank you everybody for showing up tonight. Um, I'm very excited to show this presentation. It's really the first time that I realized that I had enough photos from a particular garden that I could actually go from the first visit to the second year after and show people how what we were thinking when we met the blank slate and it was a very nice blank slate and how it developed over those two years. Now, by the end of the second year, you still don't really have a totally mature uh, garden. Really, we, we say three years or so before the before a garden uh, native garden is mature, but um, it it's um, wonderful to you know be able to show you a couple of years of development because one of the things about native gardens, most gardens, but natives especially, is that there are changes over time. So throughout the season and over the years. Be, um, the plants move around, the plants, you know, you can, you can edit and move them around. And of course they develop. Some of the plants in this uh, two years won't even be developed enough to see a bloom. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I think this might be time for me to share my screen. Now this garden is in Morton Grove and you can see from the background of this slide that there's nothing much happening in there. Um, when we first approach a garden, we want to talk about what's there, you know, when you first look at a garden, and I promise you, I'm only going to read two slides. Most of this is going to be photos, but I'm going to kind of read through these slides because in this particular garden, we had lots of different micro habitats. We had a sunny area, a, sh a couple of shady areas, a wet, a dry. We had all these, what we call micro habitats, where, you, where, where when you pick the plants, um, especially natives, because many of the plants that we use traditionally are very tolerant of a lot of conditions and that's why we use them, but natives um, are particular. And if you put them where they don't like, they're likely to move somewhere else. Uh, there was, you'll see this, the utility wires across the middle of this yard, which is kind of a little bit of a bummer, but you know, it is what it is. Um, there was an old shed and an old shade structure. You'll see that the back, um, third floods for days and days. So it, it floods back there, which is a common feature of a lot of our suburbs. Um, 
immediately behind this um, yard is a big park with sports going on and big open space, but there's a weedy ditch right behind it where there's, you know, pretty much buckthorn. Um, so we had to take out a bit of that, but um, mostly there was a lot of mowing going on. So we didn't have that much buckthorn to worry about, but it's always going to be a pro you're always going to be taking it out. Um, buckthorn being one of our ickier invasives. Um, the house is on um, a slab, so we didn't, you know, often when we approach a garden, we see problems with basement uh, inundation, flooding, that kind of thing. Well, if a house is on a slab um, and quite separated from the garage behind, behind which is, is the garden, you don't have to worry too much about, about water issues. It's a 1950s house and clay loam soil and we say circum neutral pH. I took pH here and there and everywhere, and it was pretty close to seven all around the um, the yard, with a little bit lower, a little bit more acidic under um, some evergreens. The second thing when you approach now, you know, if you're working with your own yard, you still have to consider all those existing um, conditions, but. If you're a designer, as some of you may be, you, you, you ask the homeowner what their you know, thoughts are, how, how they live, how they'll use the yard so that you can design it in such a way that it is useful to them. And often people will ask about patios or um, other kinds of structures or paths. In this case, um, the homeowner was pretty, um, somebody that I just really love because for one thing, he had nothing but lawn pretty much. And for another thing, he wanted to get rid of a lot of it. So that's always fun for us. Um, so he wanted to take out those structures, which you'll see in a minute. He wanted to absorb the flooding in the back and he was okay with the wild look, which is always nice. You know, sometimes people want their native gardens to look formal and it's possible to do that, but it takes a little more work to and, and mulch and stuff like that to keep it looking like that. And uh, he wanted a small, a place to sit while his, um, while his dog was running around. Now in bold here, you will see that we want to create a path for the greyhound because he is a big principal in this, uh, in this family. So this is Riley and Riley is the greyhound. And if you know anything about greyhounds, they love to run in circles. So you're gonna get your first good look at this yard. The homeowner sent me this, uh, Come on, run balls. this Come little on. video. So he's doing what, what greyhounds do. They like to run in circles. So that was Riley, and that was Riley running in a circle. So when I start thinking about um, a garden and what I'm going to do with it, I, I ask for a plat of survey and pray that there is one, because otherwise we have to charge a whole bunch of money to walk around and measure everything. We're going to be working in this area over here. This is the front of the house with the little path, and the house is, look, quite small. It's a 50s house on a big lot. This is the garage. So we are going to zoom into this area and this is that utilities easement where you'll be seeing these um, wires overhead. They ought to bury them. And these are those two structures. There's a funny little pergola type thing that you saw probably when the dog was being called from this area to where he was running around. And then there was a shed here um, that the homeowner also wanted to get rid of and here's the garage. So. We kind of, when we start thinking about we, this, we think, oh, okay, what am I going to do with this backyard? Well, here is um, the structures we're going to take out with the little X's. And here's the utility e easement. We can't put anything tall here. That's kind of, you know, we're stuck with that the way it is. Um, so I'm thinking, what, what do I do? What do I do with this yard? So those are, that's, this is my, we clean it up. We put it in CAD, we look at it, and we can kind of, you know, start manipulating it a little bit. 
We're first going to take a, a photo tour of the existing conditions and we're going to start. You are here. We're going to be looking at the garage and then we're going to go around in um, a clockwise direction to see what all is here and talk a little bit about what's going on um, in the current yard, which is, like we said, mostly lawn and flooding back here. So this is behind the garage. You can see these ostrich ferns here, which I took them out, um, which was probably the mi a mistake that I have to admit. There's a lot of weedy stuff back here and the ostrich ferns are happy. They're also native, um, but we had, I designed it with, you know, all my plants in mind and I took them out and we'll take a look at what happened later. Going to the right, this is the shadow of the garage over here. We have two evergreens. We have uh, evergreen species. We have a spruce and some arborvitaes. Somebody actually planted four arbor arborvitaes at the same time, but you can probably see that when you plant two that are going to be under the willow as it grows, they're, they're stunted, the two over here. So birds, as you probably know, like to hide out in evergreens. And generally, if, if, if a plant is healthy and it's non-native and it's not in the way, we kind of, uh, you know, we'll leave it there. Um, here are those lovely wires. Now the willow, the weeping willow, we're going to talk about willows in a bit too, because the the butterflies anyway, the Lepidoptera, I don't know about the other insects, but the Lepidoptera that uses willows uses weeping willow too. So even though it's from China and it's one of the first plants that was cultivated, um, originally it wasn't a weeping plant, but a weeping one was found and it's been you know, regenerated and cultivated ever since um, for, for many, I want to say hundreds of years, but I don't know the exact history of it. Anyway, so we decided to keep all these guys. There's that shed. Um, I guess one morning somebody actually, he was, uh, the homeowner was looking out the window and somebody emerged from it. There's this ditch back here and this park back here. So he decided he'd like to get rid of the shed. A um, little farther, there's another, this was a, a willow that somebody really tortured. It was a big willow at one time, but they tried to cut it down. And then of course it sprouted, which willows will do. And then here's a little going around the yard. There's some more weedy stuff, some non-native grasses. There's a Rudbeckia cultivar here of some sort. And then over here, is that crazy structure that's kind of falling down. So we're gonna take that out. And finally, the side of the garage where it's fairly shady. We're not gonna, we did plant behind this and uh, uh, under these trees, but we're not really gonna talk about that. Oh yeah, here's all the way around. This was the weediest area. We took everything out, but we do take care of our gardens. And this was the area where we were weeding for a good, you know, that first year there were plenty of weeds of all different, you know, we didn't get them all, let's put it that way, or let's just say we disturbed all the seeds that were in that bed. Well, I wanted to talk about willows because people think of them as weedy or, or whatever. Um, I love the pussy willow. It's got those beautiful, um, catkins that we'll take a peek at in a middle in, in a minute. Black willow and prairie willow, people think of them as weedy and let's take them out and whatnot. But if you have a large site, they are so good for wildlife. Um, this is the pussy willow. We did put one in the back of this yard. Um, and it's just so beautiful when the catkins come out and then when the flowers finally open, um, just a very pretty plant. And it's got a, a beautiful structure too. And of course, it's one of those plants that you can shape with a, a loppers as well. Um, but I recommend uh, using willows because check this out. This is one of our giant silk moths and one of its uh, food plants is the willow. This thing is about five inches wide. It's a gorgeous uh, moth. You may not see them, but we, we do have them around um, because like many moths, they're, they're nocturnal. Um, but when you do see them, or if you have a, a cocoon and you watch this critter emerge, it's just an amazingly beautiful creature. And we still have them. You know, we're, we're kind of wiping out some of our other fellow creatures, but um, 
some of these sort of big dramatic uh, fellows are still around. And this is a willow eater. Uh, it also eats other things. But, and when I say it eats, adult Lepidopterans drink mostly, um, but their larvae, the little caterpillars that bug everybody and that forced us to wanna go and get insect free plants from Asia and put them all over the place. The larvae eat, generally eat uh, foliage. This is the morning cloak. This is one of my favorite. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. It actually overwinters, you know, butterflies overwinter either as caterpillars. Some of them hibernate. They create a little hibernacula and like a rolled up leaf or something. Um, they hibernate as pupa, as chrysalises. Um, and cocoons if they're moths. And this, um, this one hibernates as an adult. If you can see this, um, I see people over here, so I don't, I think I can move this, but this is the underside of the, the uh, wings. And this butterfly will hide in wood piles and hollow logs and under loose bark or even in your shed and sometimes in numbers of them. But you see where the underside kind of looks like the bark around it. So it has, it's nice and disguised over the winter. And one of the, in my opinion, most beautiful butterflies, but also one of the earliest, because of course it's overwintering as an adult. So as soon as there's a warm day, you, you can see them flitting about. That's the morning cloak. The red spotted purple is another willow, um, another butterfly that eats um, willows. So you know, these are beautiful, beautiful creatures um, and giving them places to um, lay their eggs and have, have uh, reproductive capacity is important because we haven't done that so well for so many of our critters. Now this is a viceroy and you might say, really, it looks like a monarch. Well, they do look a lot alike. In fact, for a long time, it was thought that um, that the viceroy mimicked the um, monarch, which is right there, because the monarch eats milkweed and tastes bad, basically eats some um, heart poisons um, and you know makes, makes uh, the birds that eat them uh, sick. Uh, so the, the idea is once, once you eat one of these caterpillars or one of these butterflies, you're not gonna eat another. But of course, if there are two butterflies that look very similar, they both, you know, you may get predation, less predation on both species. Anyway, the most uh, recent theory is that they are what's called Mullerian, I believe, mimicry, which means they're both not palatable to, uh, palatable to birds. So um, they mimic each other uh, as kind of like, this is the warning signal, I'm black and white and orange. Now, um, the monarch has that wonderful, very slow, it kind of beats once and then it floats. Um, if you ever think you're seeing something that looks a lot like a monarch, but it kind of flutters and then floats and then flutters and then floats, that's the flight of this butterfly, it's a little bit different. So they definitely are different. And before I stop talking about butterflies, I just had to put up the monarch chrysalis because it's, it's, it's just incredibly beautiful to me. And it's literally got gold, you know, gold filigree. I mean, where the creature gets this gold, you know, like, where is it manufacturing it? Um, I almost don't want to know. It's just a wonderful, it, it's a wonderful mystery. And look at these little dots of gold. So anyway, this is why we want willows. Um, and some willows are more weedy than others, but I re highly recommend if you have a wet area that pussy willow can be used. So here's what I started thinking. Okay, so Riley wants to run in a circle. So we will leave the lawn here so he can have like an eight foot path to you know run around and that'll be you know that'll work for him and then we can have different areas around it but then of course I thought wait a minute there's it floods back here so when it's wet he's not going to be able to run you know with his be guided by um, Alexander his master 
um, without getting really muddy. Um, because of course there's our overhead wires and flooded area and whatnot. So we have to keep that in mind. So I came up with this idea. I was so excited. Um, this is the, the dry, what I'm calling the dry oval. And when this is flooded, Alexander and Riley can play over here in the dry area. And when it's, you know, not flooded, he's got a bigger area to run in. And it actually has worked. Um, and the dog does use these paths. That was one question the last time, the first and the last time I showed this presentation, Alexander was actually on and he said folks were asking him questions and he was answering them, which is pretty cool. Um, and one of the questions was, does the dog really use the paths? And the dog really does. So this is the mess that I made. Um, it's, you know, me just sketching around, um, trying to figure out how many of what go where and how to do this dry oval, wet oval, this flooded area. We're not going to talk too much about these, but these are shrubs that love to be wet. This is the willow that exists. And then there's some plants that we put under. It's like wet shade, which is kind of, you know, a, a difficult um, planting situation. And then behind the garage, there's kind of a, a hill here and you're gonna see that too, but the, it, it's very, um, the water just runs off the garage and right down the hill. So I decided we'd put a little rain garden here. Um, but I hope you're not trying to read this because it is a mess. Um, but this is typically how I start and then as I'm developing that, I'm developing a plant list. Now you'll notice, unlike other types of plantings, um, at least the way red stem does it, is we use a lot of diversity. Uh, we One, we want to serve as many creatures as we can. Um, but also, again, the micro, the micro uh, habitats. This is this is the wet species, and these are the dry species. And then other includes everything in all the peripheries. And and this particular plant list also has some areas that you don't see where we did some planting. Uh, but anyway, the these um, plant lists that we use have the type of plant, the uh, botanical name. The acronym that we use on our designs, and generally we talk about these plants using the acronyms, you know, hand me the Addy Ped or the, um, you know, the Cal Pal. <laughs> um, and these are the common names. Now, as you might know, you know, common names vary from place to place and sometimes from person to person in the same area. So we always want to make sure that when we, that we know the botanical name, and of course, that can be tricky too because the botanists are always changing them depending, depending. When um, folks started looking at genes, for instance, we went crazy and all the asters became something else. Um, so that's the plant list and we're gonna be looking at it closer like little pieces of it as we go along. But here is what my wonderful CAD guy did to the mess that I gave him. And each of these uh, acronyms. And of course, this is the, the orientation. Did I change this? Yes, I did. So this is the orientation that we've been looking at this garden in. So this is the ditch back here, and this is the garage, and this is the willow, and these are the ovals in the flooded area. So I, I turned it around so you could see a little bit better. Um, there's some, um, this is the willow, and then you can see this is a swale. Basically, the water runs off of this garage because there is like a two and a half foot um, grade right here. There's a, the garage is high and dry. So the water runs off into the gravel and into this little rain garden here. And we have some um, black chokeberries here. But you'll be seeing um, more of this in a minute. There's some red twig dogwoods here some um, swamp rose and some other shrubs. But like I said, we're not gonna be focusing on the shrubs. This is, um, I got this from Google Earth after we had finished um, 
doing the build. You can see my little ovals here. Um, this is, so here is the order we're gonna go through things. There's a swale and small rain garden. We'll take a look at that. Then there's a little shady area under the willow I wanted to talk about. Um, it's kind of hard to plant in wet shade. There's a little wild black currant hedge right here that is fantastic, uh, if I say so myself. And then there's the, um, well, this is a bench area. This is a little seating area. It's in, um, it's in a platform we made. This is brick that kind of echoes the house and then red path finds uh, that are compacted here for the, for the bench. And then the side of the garage is over here and we'll see that too. Prep work. So take that thing down, right? That was, uh, that was number one. And you can see at this point, I think we were there, it's April of 2019. So we started looking at the yard in the fall of the previous year. And now we're working on it and we can see all the weedy stuff here and we're in the process of taking everything out. Um, here we have taken everything out. One of my staff rescued this little pine here, um, planted it somewhere. Now this is a really weird looking lawn. We didn't leave it like this. Oh yeah. Back here, it was so wet that we really couldn't even work that first day. So you get an idea of what was back there. This is actually several days after it rained too. But you know, the typical day lilies and stuff that you find in ditches and whatnot, it was, it was all there. Um, so this was um, after we decide, you know, we, we, I marked out where the lawn was gonna be. This is all gonna be lawn what this is for. And um, this is, you can see plant flats out here. Um, we put a little um, uh, leaf uh, mulch, uh, sorry, leaf uh, compost over there. I'm very wary of leaf mulch from commercial places because once I used some that had lesser celandine seeds in it and uh, some of that lesser celandine is still growing where it ended up. It's just, you know, mulch is different from, it's not as broken down as compost. So if you wanna use leaves, either, you know, use your own leaf mold, your own leaf compost, or I buy it in bags. Um, so here we are, the guys are getting excited. They're filling the uh, wheelbarrows already with mulch before it's even time. Uh, we have plants, there, there are some things that have gone in already, but um, I, I've also marked some areas where I want plants that weren't there yet. We had to come back. Uh, we've got our boulders all ready to go in. I've got things marked. Um, and so this is sort of in process. I've got my boulders over here and uh, the rain gardens over here, you'll see it in a bit. <clears throat> So this is the end of the planting that first, you know, we put in the sod to, to make the correct shape uh, of the lawn. And here's the dry oval. It's got a few boulders over here. This is the rain garden. And as I said, there are three newly planted um, black chokeberries here. There's some sedges in the swale. We'll talk about that later. Um, but anyway, so that's what it looks like. This is the bench um, platform, you might say. It's uh, compacted, you know, you dig down five inches, put the uh, gravel in here and then line it with the brick that again, kind of echoes the house. And that was April 28th, 2019. And this is August 19th, 2019. Now he's on clay, clay is very fertile. Uh, you know, it has its issues as well, but one thing it has is plenty of minerals and whatnot. If it's, the, if it's the right pH, it's going to be able to support a lot of plants. So we're gonna look at a few photos before we start talking about specific plants. So this is July, 2020. This is looking at the um, garage. You can sort of see the hill over here. Um, <clears throat> This is looking the other way past the bench. And this is the same, this is uh, Queen of the Prairie in its first um, blooming year. It didn't bloom, you know, when we planted it, it was too, um, 
it, it had to mature. And cardinal flower, the lobelias are just wonderful. This is the blue lobelia. It's not, it blooms a little bit later. Um, and here is a, uh, an elderberry. We're also gonna talk about that later and some Ohio goldenrod. So I wanted to talk about the rain garden a little bit because I get to talk about the plants in it when I do that. And this was May 1st. Um, it rained um, pretty soon after we planted. So everything looks pretty much like mud with little teeny plants in it. When you buy your plants at the plant sale, most of them will be in plug form. So this is what you get, these little plugs. Um, so you can kind of see this, uh, this, pitch that I was talking about. So down at the bottom here, this has burr sedge right in the gravel. Now I don't use anything under gravel because it, it, it's plastic, it, it comes out, it doesn't work. You know, after a while these plants fill in and you don't even know there's gravel there and it does sink into the ground. And if you wanna refresh it, you can, but I always, unless I'm putting six inches of something that I don't ever want anything, you know, growing in, I don't use that uh, landscape fabric. And even then um, soil will get into the gravel, even if there is six inches of it over landscape fabric and stuff will start growing in it eventually anyway. So these are the little sedges here. And this is the rain garden from this angle. And um, same day, these are my little choke berries. And here, oh, here's the best, you know, way of looking at this thing. There's no gutters on this um, garage. So the water just falls off. Um, in fact, the garage probably needs some work over here. But this is where I took the ostrich ferns out. And remember I said I made a mistake. Well, everything I planted here, it's just such a battering experience to have that water come down here. Sometimes I'll put rock in this area. In fact, sometimes I'll put landscape fabric with five inches of rock, but I thought I would plant it. And what I did this year, which is the third year, and I have no photos from that, is put some ostrich ferns back in there because they don't mind that harsh, um, mostly shady, you know, mostly dry, except when that water is just pummeling it. It's very hard for these young plants to establish. And I lost some from this side. I think it's probably a little lopsided where more water comes down here than over there. But the ostrich ferns, I'm happy to say, are happy there, which I should have known from the beginning. And here you see the, that sedge I was talking about growing right out of the gravel. This is burr sedge, this is that sedge. Now I didn't know I was gonna do this um, presentation or I would have taken you know, pictures as I was going along from the very same angle, but you can see this is September 9th. The burr sedge, all the sedges are early, um, they're cold season uh, graminoids. So they do their, their blooming and make their seed heads early in the year. But burr sedge hangs on to these little uh, like um, medieval mace-like seed heads, which are wonderful and they usually last into the winter. But anyway, this is what came out of that. It, this is in, it's growing in the swale. And there are another couple of types of um, sedges over here too. I, I One day I'll do something on sedges alone because sedges are amazing and I use a lot of them. I think you can already see the black chokeberries are growing um, in the back here because this is about a year. Yeah, but this garden's about, it's in its second year at this point. Uh, I just want to mention the shade under this, the, um, the willows. We've got a number of sedges here that can do well in that circumstance, but we also have cinnamon fern. This is something that doesn't mind being wet, doesn't mind shade, and is doing very well here. So there are a few things, jack in the pulpit, some of the ferns, the ferns that like to be you know, inundated, don't mind that, um, and several other things, but shade, wet shade can be a problem. There's some ginger doing okay here too. I'm not sure it's gonna hang on indefinitely, 
um, but it's doing okay. You can also plant um, cardinal flower in significant amounts of shade and uh, blue lobelia, great blue lobelia, which is another lobelia, but this is really deep shade under here. Um, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put them there. And also this tree is, you know, if you've noticed plants don't like to grow under, you know, directly under um, the branches of a tree. This is the wild black currant um, hedge right after I put it in. It's right along the fence and um, it's a really neat thing. It has beautiful cheery yellow fall color, a little bit of red in it. Um, it has edible berries. It has kind of insignificant flowers, but it, it, it will eventually grow to the size of this fence. Um, this is not long after, after this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is a year after it was planted. And I wanted to show you, this is the yellowy, reddy. I, sometimes you don't get that red. This particular photo has the red in it, but it has beautiful fall color. We just happened to have some, um, the edge of that wet oval over here that you can take a peek at right now. There's um, another sedge in here, that star sedge. And these are um, Caltha palustris, um, marsh marigolds, and they also will spread and they don't mind being wet. They're a marsh plant, or at least that's, you know, they're named after a marsh. Um, so, and they never, they don't get bigger than, you know, I've seen them get, I've seen them get a foot and a half, but I've never seen that. I've seen that along riverbanks, but I have not seen that in my gardens. Generally, they stay under a foot in, in, in the gardens that I've seen, that, that I've put together. So I've, I was shocked when I saw it growing in the wild um, quite a bit bigger. So I wanted to talk about plants that work well together. And um, also some of this, you know, we're talking about microhabitats the whole time, but the idea that throughout the seasons, you, you can design for how things change. And we're gonna talk about Carex grayi and Lobelia syphilitica, which is burr sedge, we're already familiar with that, and great blue Lobelia. So right over here, this was when we came to do stewardship and we had to take these weeds out here. <laughs> Should have taken the picture after. But again, I wasn't thinking about it. So these are, um, burr sedges that have already done their blooming and they're in the winter they'll be they'll have brown those seed heads will be brown and this is the um it's july 15th and the lobelias are late bloomers like late summer early fall so they're not blooming yet but here's what this combination looks like august 17th so that's one month later it's just so pretty the the yellow of the the burr sedges burrs and the blue lobelia. I just think that's a gorgeous con um, combination. And they both like a significant amount of moisture and uh, they look good at, at different times together too. Um, but here is, is just that August, that, that mid August um, time when the, when the um, blue lobelia is really popping. There's a shady area east of the garage. This isn't everything that's in there, but it's got wild geranium, Jacob's ladder, foam flower, and star sedge. And here's what it looked like after we planted it. Not like much, right? Although you can see where the, you know, there's no gutters on this garage. And again, I think if I were, now it's all filled in now, you'll see it in a minute, but if I were planting this again, I might put something here in the way of rocks to keep the splash back here. But again, we planted plants that are going to fill that in. These are sedges. And this is May 13th of 2020. So it's it's a year later. And we have foam flower that's going to fill in that's going to, you know, sort of wend its way through these other things. Jacob's ladder. Um, this is early meadow rue. I didn't have that on there because it's, I didn't list it because it's not blooming, but there's some other stuff in here too. And of course, wild geranium. So it's a really pretty area where we had, you know, just a lot of shade and um, just a, a, a pretty spring um, bloom. And it'll get prettier with, with successive springs too, because there's still, you know, we still had to mulch it uh, this year because, or the, the 2020, 
because there are still a lot of spaces between these plants, but their habit is to fill in. Dry oval. Okay, now we're getting to those two little things that I felt so clever about because the dog will run through here and then go farther up when it's wet. So this is the plant list from that oval. Now, again, this, this oval is maybe 15 feet by 12. You know, it's, it's, there's just, it's just not that big. We just cram, I mean, if you, if you are a botanist or you've been out in the wild and you've done one of those transects in a prairie at the beginning of the spring and you go out there with a botanist and they're unbelievable, they'll say, you know, this is Jen Ann, Leah Speep, Fong, yep, yep. They use the, the acronyms to tell you what's in there. You'll find that in a three by three square, you've got, you know, 30 species. So, um, so we kind of mimic that. And it's also true that with natives, for the most part, they bloom only a, a couple of weeks here, a month there. So it's really great to have the succession throughout the season, as well as understanding that things, there's a big plant here, Silphium uh, terebinthinaceum, um, prairie duck, that is not even visible by the end, barely visible by the end of this second year. But that's going to be a huge plant at some point, smack dab in the middle here. So these are the plants in this area. Um, some of them can handle more moisture, but most of them are, are very happy in a dry situation. And we're, we're going to talk about some of them. But you can see that there's a lot of plants packed in here. And um, so this is the rain garden is right here. So that that dry oval is right at the beginning and the bench is right here. So we'll see some photos of that. So this is um, last spring, like a year into the planting when things are just starting to come up right, right around now, um, actually. And so this is that first year, things are still pretty immature, but very, not immature, just, just starting to, to come out. Um, we, we do have blooming uh, in the shady areas because typically um, the spring plants take advantage of the light in the early spring and some of them disappear altogether. They do their entire cycle. You know, the ephemerals do their entire cycle in the shade um, before the shade is there, you know, uh, in the, the light of the early spring. Um, there's actually some Jacob's Ladder on the edge here. It gets more, I saw it this year, it's much more, it's fluffier and much more filled in. We're starting to see Rattlesnake Master. It looks like um, yucca leaves. Uh, that's why it's called Eurygium yuccafolium because it has yucca-like leaves. And a few different kinds of sedges, including, I think this is burr sedge. You get the idea, I like burr sedge. At least when I built this garden, I was in a, I love burr sedge moment. So the next slide, um, I've just, this is um, from that list. I'm going to highlight the Ohio goldenrod and the little blue stem, even though the photo is not super great of the little blue stem. It's kind of, there's a little river of it going through here. And it looks gorgeous. Um, it'll look gorgeous this winter, especially when it's fully mature. But these are Ohio goldenrod. There are several goldenrods that don't go crazy. If you have um, a native garden or almost any garden, you'll eventually get Canadian goldenrod. It's actually a native, but it's so aggressive um, and so hard to dig out of the ground that if you let it take hold, it's very tough to get rid of and it will take over. Ohio goldenrod, which is Solidago ohioensis, is more, um, oh, is it still Solidago? I don't know. I think so. It may have another uh, genus now. I sort of thinking it might. Anyway, it's uh, not so aggressive. It is, you know, uh, exuberant. It, it will spread somewhat, but it won't take over your garden. And as you can see, it's, it's an early uh, goldenrod. You know, you get goldenrods that bloom. This is September 7th. So it starts blooming like at the end of August. Some goldenrods don't bloom until later. And in some cases, depending on the size of the garden and number of other things, I'll put more than one goldenrod in so that you have this kind of succession of goldenrods. But I did want to mention that. And look, there's one little rattlesnake master here, but you'll see what it does a little bit later, because this is 2019. This is the first 
uh, fall. Uh, Echinacea, Leatris pycnostachia, and Monarda fistulosa, that's wild bird, bergamot, prairie blazing star, and purple coneflower. Look at that during the summer. It's um, midsummer. Um, this is only, this is last summer, which is the second year. And all of this stuff blooming together, the purples and pinks and stuff, I love that. Um, and, the, and the bench is right here. And I don't know if you noticed, but this is a completely brand new house. <laughs> While we were, um, when I was first measuring and hanging around, which is something that I do before I design a garden, I kind of, you know, walk around and try to imagine where would be the best place to sit if they want a seating place and where is the sun hitting and all that kind of thing. There was nothing here. So this whole structure was built um, and the garage that you might've seen, the, there was a ratty garage here was torn down as well. So the rattlesnake master I mentioned, you saw one little bloom of it and the prairie dock, which you can't hardly see, but I wanna mention it. Look at that rattlesnake master. Um, here we are last year, so midsummer second year, and it's just doing its beautiful rattlesnake master thing. And because we have a lot of plants in there, it's not going to take over. You know, it can get very, it can get very, I don't like to use the word aggressive because it sounds like it's out to get somebody, but it's, it's exuberant and it's a beautiful plant and it loves, this is a sunny area, somewhat dry. Um, it just, it's happy here. But I want to point out this plant, this plant at one year old down here is prairie dock and it's tiny. And here's what it looks like when it's mature. It takes a few years. These leaves get to be, you know, I'm, I, I don't think my screen will show you. They can be, they can be two and a half feet long, maybe even longer. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they get longer than that. But out of the basal, uh, basal leaves, and this is true of all the um, sylphiums, and there are four native sylphiums, with different leaf shapes and, and somewhat different habits, but they all do this thing of sending up beautiful sunflower-like flowers late in the season. And some of them like cup plant are very, I would say aggressive in the case of, <laughs> of cup plant. Um, but this one prairie duck is, is much less so. And I can't wait till the middle of that bed has this in it blooming. Um, like I said, right now, it's just a teeny, teeny little guy. Here, I think I can't, okay, palm sedge. All right, so I use palm sedge, another one that can get exuberant. Again, if you put a lot of aggressive plants into the same bed, they will check each other. That's another thing to think about. Um, palm sedge, um, where is it? It's planted behind this rock here. I like to put palm sedge behind rocks because they it does a wonderful thing behind boulders. And I don't always do that, but, and I think I said in my last um, presentation, I was gonna stop doing it because people see the palm sedge behind the boulder and there's like, okay, that's Monica's garden. You know, you get these habits. Um, anyway, this is a, rather terrible picture. What it is, is a much bigger picture where I zeroed in on the palm sedge coming up behind here. But I took a picture of a different one of our gardens. And that's what palm sedge, you can see why it's called palm. Uh, it's a sedge, which means it's a, a grass-like plant and, an, and um, a cold season plant. But isn't it just graceful and lovely behind a boulder? And like I said, I think too many of my gardens have boulders with palm sedge behind them. Um, if you have a lot of space and you plant a lot of palm sedge, you're just going to have palm sedge everywhere. So you have to kind of mix it in with things that are going to keep it in check. Um, the boulders help too. Rubecchia fulgida. So Rubecchia herta, which is the black-eyed Susan most people plant, that's a short-lived uh, plant. It's a... Um, I think some, some books have called it a biennial. I, I think it's a short-lived perennial, uh, but in any case, it, it, it 
reseeds, but it, it's not strictly perennial. The Rebecca fulgida actually reseeds also, um, but it is, um, it's, it's a perennial. It'll hang out for a lot longer than, um, than its cousin. And here it is, the first summer, uh, sorry, September, the first fall. It blooms late in the summer, early fall. And you can see that one little um, rattlesnake master over here. And you can barely see, I think this might, I don't know, one of the photos I, I zoomed in here and you can barely see the palm sedge coming up over here. But anyway, I just wanna show you. So September, 2019, here's Rudbeckia. There are three plants there. July, 2020, everything is starting to fill in, get, get exuberant. You might not realize, but this thing is full of buds. So this is July and this is less than three weeks later. Look at that. That's three weeks later. This is, it's getting ready to pop. And then it has popped. Anyway, I thought you would enjoy that. Because when I planted these, you couldn't even see them. I think you saw, you know, little plants, but we know, you know, once we've worked with these plants, what they're going to look like. And this can get, you know, again, it's surrounded by, by stuff that's going to keep it in check, but it, it can get um, like that. <laughs> and it can also reseed. The wet oval. So the wet oval has some terrific things. I love wet areas, especially in this case, there's actually sun in a wet area. And, and that's fantastic because you can have, um, you can have uh, the, uh, the lobelias cardinal flower, which is that gorgeous red and, and um, lobelia um, syphilitica, which is blue. You can have Ohio goldenrod, but you can also have rushes. There's um, a juncus in here that's common rush. Bucksbaum sedge is a really cool looking sedge. Um, I've got burr sedge in here too. I think I got carried away with the burr sedge. Queen of the prairie. Oh my gosh, it's just one of my favorite plants and it loves moisture. So this is early. This is um, that wet uh, bed in September of the first year. You see the um, the elderberry here. It's just this little demure little sh little um, shrub, and these are the Rosa palustris, the the swamp rose. They are both. They're all going to go crazy back there and and fill that area. You won't be able to see this fence, uh, but right now they're just doing their little thing. We've got the Bucksbaum sedge over here. This is star sedge. Um, and these are the juncus. They're much more upright. Um, and they all grow a little bit bigger. This again is, is that first season. And this is in May of that year. Did I actually, yeah, I actually, oh, I see. This is, I'm see, this is spring of the next year. So there's not much happening here, I thought. The first year, oh, deer just jump right over this, by the way, and eat everything. Um, and the first year, they, the uh, queen of the prairie came up and it bloomed and the deer jumped over and ate all the blooms. So I thought, well, it's done. And then this year I saw where I had put the queen of the prairie, there was nothing there. And I was very sad um, because I thought they, well, they didn't get the roots. Oh, oh, before I talk about the queen of the prairie, I have to talk about the star sedge and the marsh marigold. You saw that before um, in a photo. I just thought I would point it out. These are the leaves of marsh marigold. Um, unfortunately, they look a lot like lesser celandine, which is a, a beast, a, a beastly invasion, uh, invasive. Um, but this is what it looks like when it's it, it fills in and it blooms this happy yellow very, very early in the year. So it's a, a lovely early plant for wet areas. Um, here we go, the queen of the prairie and the culver's root, which these are the two, these are blooms from each of these plants. Queen of the prairie, it's just one of my favorite pl plants. I mean, I don't, I don't mean there are any favorites really, I love them all. But um, queen of the prairie looks like cotton candy. 
and it really does look like cotton candy. Um, it's got this really wonderful, subtle scent, especially when it's really sunny, you know, it kind of comes and goes. So you'll pick it up and then it'll be elusive and then it'll come back. It's, a, it's an amazing plant. It's also very hardy as long as it gets moisture. Culver's root, when it's mature, it looks like little candelabra. It's just fantastic. And together they look wonderful. Now we don't have mature ones. It's gonna take another year or so, maybe by the end of this year, but here they are together. And it's July 15th, 2020. The deer did not destroy the queen of the prairie because here it is with its little cotton candy blooms. And these are the, the little spires of the culver's root. And that will get, you know, more like that over time. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll bloom a little taller and a little fuller as long as it's happy and it ought to be happy here. You know, sometimes we make um, judgments about which plants to blend or bring together and then one will just decide, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. Um, so far so good with these guys. It's a combination I love. Um, this is kind of a nothing slide. I do, I did want to mention the Asclepius incarnata, which is rose milkweed. Um, the, <clears throat> the lobelia isn't even blooming yet. It's, it's right here. Sorry. It's over here too, but it's, you can see it coming up, but I just wanted to note that the, um, <clears throat> swamp milkweed is there. And it is also, of course, a host plant of the, um, monarch butterfly just like the common milkweed that we're all much more familiar with. So here we have Queen of the Prairie, Cardinal Flower and Ohio Goldenrod. We're gonna point those out because they're doing something together that's amazing. So this is August, this is last summer. Look what happens to the Queen of the Prairie. It turns into this wonderful copper the seeds are just so sweet. Look at that, isn't that pretty? And the leaves get yellow. So it's it's got like so many different um, different aspects that it 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 on un that unfold through the year. And remember, you saw I think you saw this goldenrod in September. It's actually pretty just before it blooms. It's kind of a chartreuse. And of course, the cardinal flower is just spectacular. Now, cardinal flower is an odd one. It will disappear some years and then reappear. It really likes consistent moisture. Um, some people treat it like an annual. They love it. So they'll buy the gallon size every year to make sure they have it. I've heard different gardeners um, and, and different landscape people say, oh, I always lay down the seed. I cut them and lay them down and make sure there's nothing growing around them. So the seeds will re-sprout they're you know somewhat short-lived but they do reseed but if you want to have these you kind of you either have to work at it or you have to have just the right circumstances for it or you have to be willing to just let it the seeds will germinate during wet years and last year was a wet year wet enough for these guys but you can just see how everything is just unfolding and in the background here by the way here we are one year later you can see the um the elderberry getting, it's got its berries too, getting a little bit exuberant. I think I have another close up of the elderberry. Oh yeah, I just threw in this uh, Ohio goldenrod because it's not blooming quite full here, but you already saw it bloom. So you kind of know what it does. Had to mention the cardinal flower and the ruby throated hummingbird. This bird, I've seen this photo I've seen this happen in a million photos. It's like the flower was made for this bird. It like pats it on the head and drops its, you know, pollen on the head and then it goes to the next plant and pollinates it. It's just the perfect, it, it attracts, hummingbirds love that red and this particular flower is just built for that little beak. Just amazing. I think I'm getting late here. So I'm gonna speed up a little. I've been talking too slow. I hope nobody's falling asleep out there. This is elderberry, lovely, big. You see how it was teeny before, now it's already over the fence. And of course it will get huge if you let it, but you can cut it all the way to the ground and it'll bloom that same year. 
Um, the Cecropia moth eats elderberry. I have one client that has a big elderberry bush and then it ha and then she's got a viburnum. And these usually, I don't know if you remember back in the day when we had a lot of these caterpillars, you would see these on the sidewalk crushed. You know, they're big and they, they migrate, not migrate, they take a walk before they turn into a cocoon and they generally look for something that's denser than their food plant. So I remember as a kid seeing them walking all the time um, and I don't see them so much anymore, but I do live in the city and uh, the, the garden I'm talking about where I see these guys in the viburnums every year, um, that's in Wilmette. And this is what comes out of that cocoon, a cecropia moth. Another, I could go on and on about this, but as I said, it's after eight and I don't want everybody, actually it's past my bedtime. So um, this is, uh, the homeowner sent this to me and I just thought I would include it. It's just a, a garden when it's in full, you know, late season bloom, but a windy day. Just beautiful. So I did want to mention the winter before I wrap this up. I was telling um, Beth that I take 45, 50 minutes. I think I'm going over an hour here. I don't, you make me talkative somehow. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that leaving things up for various insects that hide in the stalks or otherwise or burrow under or make, you know, nests and whatnot, it's pretty. And leaving them up is, is really good for, being too clean in the fall means you're, you're mulching a bunch of insects. And if you like look at this, I think it's a mountain mint or some, I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, if you don't like the look of something, cut it. But, so I did wanna mention the black swallowtail because it's one of those um, that will never go well, we hope it won't go extinct because it eats your dill and your fennel and your Queen Anne's lace, which is, you know, kind of a, an exuberant non-native and it has a native plant. Here's the, you've seen them. They're big, beautiful swallowtail. It also eats golden alexanders, which is um, a native um, in that same APACA carrot family. It'll eat carrots too, by the way. And uh, what's the other one? Um, parsley, you know, it's just, it's never gonna go extinct because it has so many plants that it eats. And this is something I just want you to see. My last slide. It's a black swallowtail coming out of its bristles. Butterfly magic? Yeah. I just got done playing my video game. So, you know, when you think about it, kids kids aren't gonna, if you don't teach them to pay attention and love nature and be fascinated like this kid is right after his video game, they're not gonna take care of it. So I, I, I love this. I love this little tiny video. And this is it folks. <laughs> We're gonna watch this butterfly a little bit longer. This is when these butterflies are very um, vulnerable. They can't fly until they pump the blood into their wings. They're wet, but it's kind of cool to see this butterfly's first moments as a butterfly. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm ready to take uh, questions, I hope. Sometimes I, I regret saying I'm ready, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica. That was terrific. I've had a chance to see that presentation twice and I, I learned so much additionally watching it again and took lots of notes. And I'm sure a lot of our other uh, people have taken notes. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start the Q&A. It's 8.10, we, do, um, we will stop at 8.30. So we're gonna divide our time first with Monica and then if any of you have questions about um, our um, native plant sale, which is this Saturday, 
from 9 to 11. Um, after Monica's done with some questions, Nancy Pavkovich can answer those. So with that, uh, we're going to introduce Maria um, Dabrowski. She is an associate for Go Green Wilmet, and she is going to moderate the Q&A. So you can keep adding your questions to the Q&A. Looks like we've got 15. So um, we're going to have to answer relatively quickly. So we have a lot, I have a chance to get to most Monica, of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Maria, it's up. Uh, you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Monica. That was fantastic. I have a, a, a swallowtail chrysalis waiting to Oh, wonderful. Now, so I'm very excited by that video. Monica, if you wouldn't mind stopping your screen share. I tried. I think I, <laughs> I, think I have to get out of this um, laser thing. So let me try. And you know what? It's also completely fine if you want to leave it up for the sake of time and getting to Oh, some I think I can do it now. I don't know. Okay. No, I can't. Oh, Beautiful. there yep. you go. Wonderful. Yay. Okay. So we have quite a few questions about weeds. Hmm. Um, one question was asking specifically if there is a sustainable way to keep weeds under control and also one that doesn't involve manually pulling them out. What are your thoughts on that? Especially I'm seeing a lot of things here about dandelions and clover. Well, if clover is in grass, I would just leave it. You know, it's it's better than grass for the pollinators. But of course, if it's in your beds and dandelions and everything else. Well, there is. So we pull uh, we pull our weeds. We, we do our stewardship once a month and we generally pull weeds. Um, one of the the concepts in native plantings and what works in the prairie and what works in a mature native garden is that the plants get so tightly knit together that they don't allow weeds very much. That's why it's so much harder to have a more formal look where they're not all scrunched together. So a mature garden will keep weeds out, but you have a new garden and you have a ton of weeds. Well, there is somebody writing now about cutting with a scissors instead of pulling because if, and this is for somebody who is able to walk out into their garden, you know, every other day or at least a couple times a week, um, because you're not disturbing the soil. What happens when we pull weeds is we're opening up for light and moisture a whole lot of opportunities for seeds to sprout. So we're basically, until those other plants close up, we have to either mulch, and mulch is a way to keep weeds down, not out and dandelions will come right through it and then you get your dandelion puller which has a long thing you know with a little snake uh, tongue at the bottom um but really I, I i i've been trying that cutting thing in my own yard which is tiny it's, it's why i got into landscaping because my yard is tiny and um basically you don't allow the plant to photosynthesize and it will give up after a while so of course, if you have an acre, you're not going to go around cutting your weeds. Right. But uh, you can you can mulch, and you can plant. I, I guess the 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 first thing to do plant densely. That's what we do. We plant that was very. Question. Yeah, we plant very densely. You could see that we put. You know, we have 130 square feet, and we put 99 plants in there. Is there a rule of thumb for how close or far apart you should have certain species or just in general? You know, um, it, it, it does depend on the plant. Now you could plant eight, everything 18 inches apart and you know, you could clump them so that the butterflies can see, you know, the, the eight or nine that are clumped together. Um, but you know, if you, if you know your plants, you know, if you know that, um, like spikenard, American spikenard gets to be four feet wide and seven feet tall. Of course, you you might plant something like um, you know, like some little sedges around it that that help keep the weeds down, but that will eventually just kind of disappear. Uh, you don't want to plant something else big right next to it. I mean, so yeah, you can do eighteen inches, or you could do a foot. I mean, in woodland plantings, because they grow slowly, we plant at least, I mean, we plant a foot or closer sometimes. Okay. It oh. depends on the size of the plant, you know. Right. right. Um, Jacob's ladder, less than a foot. Um, you know, other bigger plants, you know, like any of the woodland goldenrods, I will I'll only put one here and one there, that kind of thing. So it requires a little bit of research before you before you start. 
Yeah, but like I said, if you if you do plant plants too close together, you can pull them out. Yeah, That's an excellent point. Always always be willing to edit, and right. you know I I know people who say no, don't take it out. It's a plant, you know. But um, you know, we eat plants, so we do. We do. They are delicious. Um, we have a question here. Um, are there any short height annuals you would recommend that could be planted from seed to compensate for the extra blank spaces between new plantings the first year? Quite mm. a few people thumbs up that one. So it seems to be of interest. Oh dear. See, now I never really got interested in standard landscaping. So annuals, um, there aren't very many annuals among, um, I'm actually blanking. There are a couple, uh, but I'm blanking out on them. There aren't very many annuals among the natives, which is really my area of expertise. Sure. But you can certainly put in plants that will flower in the first year, like uh, Rudbeckia herda, you know, that will flower and be exuberant the first year. And then you can just, as other plants get bigger, you can just cut them down or take them out or, or whatever. Um, they, you know, that plant can get to be three feet tall, though, in the sun. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that one as well as, as I would like to. I think the fact that there aren't many annuals that are natives is, is an interesting thing that people should perhaps, perhaps don't know. And that's an important thing to consider when people are looking into doing their own native planting. So now, that, that I, is a helpful answer. But, but there's another thing to say there. There are native um, annuals, but they're not landscaping plants. Landscaping you know, there, plants. there are native annuals. Right. Okay. That's a great clarification. Thank you. Um, someone was talking about wildlife habitat habitat for beyond birds and insects for other of our maybe native um, mammals. Do you have any any feedback on that? What what things are good for they put some things that some people may consider nuisance animals like foxes, coyotes, deers. Or do well, you mostly tailor your, your native planting gardens to things like pollinators and birds who are in desperate need of having good habitat? Yeah, so um, if you have a, a, a native garden, um, I mean, I like to throw logs into my gardens. Um, I had a shortage last year. We really didn't throw many logs around. I, I had an agreement with the forest preserve for a while. Um, you can you can create, you know, with the bases of your big grasses and then a log going like over them, you can create little nooks and crannies that small mammals like to hide in. Um, they will, if you have a prairie situation, you are going to have small, you know, small mammals enjoying. Um, I mean, I have a friend with a prairie, a bit pretty big prairie that she um, lets her brother-in-law mow and, you know, they can see all the little critters, you know, running away. Oh. Um, so, um, you know, foxes, I mean, the, the thing about, about bigger animals and predators, well, deer are not a predator. Um, but they'll eat almost anything, you know, they won't eat hairy things, they won't eat um, uh, aromatic things, they won't eat and you can make this long list and then they'll go ahead and eat them because if you have a lot of deer, they'll eat anything. Um, but the predators are going to be there if you have the smaller animals. So right. that's the other thing. It's, you know, it's a food chain thing. Right. Yeah, you got to support the base to have the, the mammals. Yeah, you, you support the smaller ones and then you'll get the bigger ones. And, you know, frankly, well, I know coyotes can be scary and can eat your cat, I guess. I, I don't really know, because, but they're, you know, it's I, I rejoice when I see them. Oh, me too. And I, I don't see them as often as everyone else in Wilmette seems to see them, but I think they're wonderful. Um, we have a question about culti cultivars versus true natives. Oh boy. Oh boy. That'll be, I think that'll be the last question before we move over to Nancy. So what are your thoughts? Well, we specialize in true natives and we do that because cultivars are man-made plants that are patented and allow the maker 
to make money indefinitely as long as they sell. The guy who developed the Annabelle, you know, hydrangea is, you know, undoubtedly, you know, made a, a killing off that one. Now, some plants, and I think the Annabelle might be among them, are just found, you know, they're, when you have a full genetic complement, you get strange things. You'll get a big, you know, a plant that has a big flower. And um, I think, and that's called a selection. And then basically every Annabelle after that is cloned. I'm pretty sure. Now they might, they also will take selections and breed them, you know, so that they have, so that the characteristic can be emphasized. There are a lot of different ways of creating, uh, you know, I'm not, um, oh, I forget the name, you know, a person who develops plants. But the thing is, the cultivars are developed because we want a bigger flower or we want a different color or we want something that's shorter. And I mean, to me, you're just confusing the, the natural um, order of things when you're changing the color and size. I mean, every, every garden full of, or every prairie full of different stuff has like different size bees that use particular plants, different size, the butterflies, tongues, they all have different um, preferences. And when you change their food plants, I mean, it, for me, it's not about, it, it's of course about aesthetics. I think you picked that up from, from what I, I say, but um, it, it's also about the wildlife. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, we don't even really even know. We know that red plants that are bred to have red leaves don't get the larvae, but I suspect there's almost everything we do to a plant turns something off that used to used to you know that evolved with it so that's my we don't know yeah now i do make exceptions right you know, if somebody loves a per, if somebody really wants an evergreen you know there are smaller evergreens whereas you know the the our native pine will get to be 40 feet wide and 80 feet tall and not right. too many yards can handle that so right. i don't want to take up all the time but i don't like cultivars Okay, in conclusion, we don't like cultivars. Well, thank you, Monica. Yes, we do have a few questions for Nancy Pavkovich, board member of Go Green Will Met, um, specifically about the plant sale, which again is this Saturday, May 8th from nine to 11 at the Gilson Park Swim Beach parking lot in Will Met. Um, Nancy, will we have common milkweed at the plant sale? And if not, why not? Yes, we'll actually have common milkweed as well as swamp milkweed. So we will have those available and we've ordered extra this year because they've been so popular <laughs> in the past and we've gotten a lot of questions about them. So those should be available. Excellent. That is wonderful. And we had another, oh, we did have a question. Some people are wondering about cost, what they can expect cost-wise. Um, I, I, excuse me, Paco, please go down. I imagine that for some people, cost is a big consideration when starting a native garden. And so what can you say about the prices that people can- Actually, um, our prices are some of the best around. I can say most, most plants and grasses or flowers and grasses will be about $5. There are a few that are a little bit more and trees and shrubs are between twenty and thirty dollars, so they're really priced well. We we really our goal is to get plants in gardens, so we want to make this really easy for people to be able to buy and plant and enjoy. Will there be people there that can answer plant questions? There will be some people there that can answer plant questions. You'll just have to come around and find us. But we'll be wandering around, and it will be socially distanced. People, um, we're asking that you wear a mask if you do come to the plant sale. And um, just so you know, we have ordered over 3,200 plants and we have over 75 species all together. So there'll be a really wonderful selection. And if you go to gogreenwomet.org, you'll find um, a list of the plants we're expecting to have. Of course, it all depends on the nursery, but it does have information about wetness and also sunshade, light shade, et cetera. So you can find information there. And um, a great point from Ann Nagel that there will also be a bike donation happening at the plant sale. So come get some plants, drop off an old bike that you don't need. Um, Nancy, I, one, one more quick question. When should people be arriving? I know we have it from nine to 11, but do you have any tips, insider information? Certainly you'll wanna 
get down there, you might want to find a parking spot if it's a really nice day. It's a perfect day to just gaze at the lake or maybe walk down to the beach, but we are holding off sales until 9 a.m. just to give everyone a fair chance. So you can arrive early. It's a wonderful place to be, but um, yeah, don't expect to get there at 8.30 and to be able to buy plants. We are going to hold off until 9 and we're going to, you know, it, it should be a really nice large space with the, you know, you, so you'd be able to walk around and enjoy, enjoy being there. And do we often sell out of plants? We sell out of plants every year, it seems. So I um, definitely do plan on coming a little early if you are really anxious to get something specific. Otherwise, um, you know, there, there will be a few things left, uh, not as popular, but we are really taking comments. So if there's something you want and you don't see this year, let us know and next year we'll try and get it for you. That's wonderful. I think that's all the questions we have for you, Nancy, unless I've missed any, but I don't think I have. Oh. Cash or credit for payment, we take cash, credit, and checks. Exactly. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Maria. Oops, I got, okay. So thank you so much. Um, that was a great presentation and loved all the questions. There's so much more to say, um, but wanna make sure that um, you know that we've got a Gilson, we've got bird habitat above where the plant sale is. So why don't you add a little bit of time to your schedule and make sure you go wander up and look at that bird habitat. It's in year three or four and it's wonderful. We're going to have a work day. You can come learn with us and help with that habitat on May 16th from nine to noon or even for just 15 minutes anytime in that window. Um, when you come to the plant sale, as Nancy said, please do bring a mask. And bring something to take your plants home in. A laundry basket actually works really well, or bring two. Um, cardboard box works as well. It's possible that we, you know, sometimes have a hard time keeping up with the demand for boxes. And so bring your own will make it easier for you to do your shopping. Um, if you don't get Go Green Nomads newsletter, please think about signing up for it because that is comes out twice a month and it's a pretty good record of lots of events that are happening all over, not just in Wilmette, but um, at some of our colleagues' events as well. If you are from a community that does not have an environmental advocacy group, we call them Go Green Groups, um, please know that we are helping communities start those. You can go to gogreenillinois.org. We have our next meeting on Tuesday, and we would love for you to consider starting or joining a group like that in your community. So with that, I want to thank Monica Buckley. You are such an inspiration. And I love the fact that we can all look at what you did in just one yard and extrapolate to see, well, gosh, I've got some of those issues in my yard too. Um, spread the word to your friends that if they want to, they can watch this webinar. It'll be posted by Friday at the latest and will be available for everyone to watch. And you might want to watch it a second time to uh, get, get some extra tips like I did the second time I watched it. Um, so again, our next webinar, we is going to be bird watching at Gilson Park on May 19th. And um, Maria has started uh, beach cleanups in Wilmette. You are welcome to clean up our beach or any beach you find yourself on. Um, ours are every other uh, Saturday throughout the summer season. And our next one is May 15th. And we have bird watching every Sunday in May during the migration at 8 a.m. at the south end of Gilson Park. So um, good luck with your gardening efforts. Um, you can find Monica at Red Stem Landscape. If you're interested in some professional help, she would be uh, happy to help you, although I expect you're pretty, um, pretty busy, Monica. Yeah. So the good thing is, I think COVID is, has, has really created a lot of demand for um, making backyards and uh, making them healthy and natural and great habitat is one thing we can all do to help the planet and as well as something that we could really enjoy ourselves too. So with that, we're going to stop the recording and um, conclude. So to all of our guests, thank you for coming and um, we'll see you again for the next webinar. Good night. Okay, so our guests are going to be signing off, but um, those of us who, who helped create this webinar, many, many thanks um, to all of you. Monica, that was a great, great presentation. 
Nancy, how what fun to be able to answer questions about the, the plant sale, which is great. Thanks to Maria, who just put up our Facebook post about it today. Maria, thank you for being with us as well. Sterling, our behind the scenes technology person. We still have 24 people listening to me. Thank all of you. Um, Sterling, thank you for, for being with us again. So Monica, um, this is gonna be, feel free to link to your own webinar from your, um, you know, from, from your website. So that would be great. You can unmute if you want to. And um, so what one thing we're a little bit concerned about is having enough experts to answer questions Saturday. So if anyone is still who's still on, the 20 participants that are still on, if anybody wants to help answer some questions, I'm quite sure there's going to be a lot of shoppers and they're going to have a lot of questions. So that's that's something we're going to have to um, uh, work on. Oh, Monica, I got a great compliment to do you from Margaret Goss of Winnetka, who said you've done her garden. I have. And she said it looks absolutely wonderful. And even though she knows how great you are, she was going to sign on to um, to listen to this oh, webinar as well. That's very sweet. Thank you. Yeah. So are, are you just slammed with work? Yeah. It's it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you know, I, I, I think we're going to end up designing a bunch of stuff later this year for next year because the, everyone is is interested it's just i mean it's great i think you'll run out of your thousands of plants you know in an hour i mean people are really into natives right now and i love it um as long as they're not putting in cultivars and i know you're not about that so <laughs> so but a question oh like for instance rubecchia goldstrom that's the rubecchia that you can buy everywhere but that's a cultivar right Wherever you see a single quotes around uh, like a, a name that's obviously somebody's patent, you know, Dancing Dolls or, you know, or Goldstrom or somebody's name, the single quotes is the signal that it's a cultivar. So it's, it's really hard for those of us to, to get true natives. Like if we go to a, a regular garden shop, isn't it mostly cultivars? Yeah. Well, again, that's the, the economic thing. The folks who develop them, market them, send out little cards with the latest cultivar. They look different often. They're different colors. You know, they're interesting yeah. and people like new stuff. Um, they're like just the hot, like the hot pink cone flower. Exactly. Or the one with the three different heads on it. You know, I mean, there's just some people like the novelty and um, that's what you get at most gar garden centers. Um, uh, now Gethsemane has great ferns, you know, for some reason, but that's because a fern will look good and sit on a shelf for a month. Most of our plants only bl bloom for a few weeks, so it's hard to keep them looking, you know, annuals will sit there on the shelf for weeks and weeks and weeks looking, you know, like buy me, buy me. I keep thinking I should open a retail place, but I'm having a hard enough time keeping up with the current yeah. business. <laughs> So I hope somebody does. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm a big gardener and I walk through my garden with Karen Glenemeyer and then again with Amanda Nugent. And I realized to my horror that 80% of what I have is probably non-native. And it's, it's horrifying. I have English, I have Vinca everywhere. It's just like thick crowding everything else out. So um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking that a lot of people are like me. They're just awakening to the fact that you can be a beautiful gardener and have a lovely looking yard and be providing very little in, in the way of habitat. Excellent. Congratulations. So, I, I wish you luck. And if you want to email me or text me or whatever, just ask me questions. Just if I don't answer you, that means I'm slammed. <laughs> Well, I know you're not so that I don't love you, but I do try to, I do try to get back so to people. <laughs> thinking, oh God, if I'd asked Monica like uh, eight months ago, I'd have a really nice garden plan instead of thinking <laughs> I can do this on my own. Monica, um, I have a question really quick, yeah. if I can, Beth. How long does it take you to diagram and make a schematic of, obviously it depends on the size of the garden, but how long does that process take you in general? to come up with, is it, is it that the bulk of the time is actually the planting or the bulk of the time is actually the planning? 
Well, the planning is, is takes a lot, yeah. many, many hours, you know, lots of thinking. I, I, I love it because I like to continue to research, you know, and, and, and think about and, and think about the soil that I'm talking about in the yeah. circumstances. But frankly, I don't make my money there. We do charge, we charge for consultations. Now we charge for designs and we charge a significant amount for designs, but I, I probably make, you know, I don't make money on them. <laughs> Let's right. put it that way. Um, but it's the it's the installations and the caring where I'm able to have my 15 people that work for me sure. and provide them benefits and do you know I don't believe in not paying people. But it's 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 a um, we have to. Um, there's another aspect to this, and that's the plants. We have to to maintain a nursery because we have to order 50 of something and we only need 10 and we, we you know, it, it's, we have thousands of plants. So we're, we're gonna be doing plant sales, not to compete with the spring ones, but we'll be doing one in July oh, cool. and uh, one in probably, I'm sorry, late June, late August and October, uh, but they're very specific. They're plants that we happen to have on. It's mm -hmm. not like Go Green Well Met where they're ordering, you know, it's basically plants that we need to not overwinter. Although last year, all of our plants overwintered. It was amazing. They love that snow blanket. Wow. We, we still have 17 people online listening to the-, uh, the Oh the my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one last question, then we'll let you go. Monica, you said that you definitely have your favorite things. How do you make your gardens unique so they don't all look the same at all your clients? I keep hiring new designers. No, <laughs> um, I get tired of things and I try to find new things. You know, that's kind of my personality, you know, like I don't like showing up at work and doing the same thing every day. Um, and there's kind of infinite, not infinite. I mean, our rain gardens almost always have um, marsh marigold around the edges if they have the right other circumstances like, you know, pH and, and and the right amount of sun, they can deal with some shade. Um, rain gardens almost always have um, um, swamp milkweed, you know, the, or rose milkweed is what it's called these days. But there are certain things that do get repetitive, but we're always exploring new plants or plants that we don't use much or that we haven't used before and bringing them in and trying them out. And you know, that's why, and sometimes our experiments in people's yards don't work, but we always make sure that there's enough that does work, that that's kind of okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, we're all inspired for um, getting good. into the garden and um, thank you so much and, and good luck. I hope that your busy business allows you some time to sit back and savor all that you've done to provide beautiful gardens and habitats for all of us in our area. Thank you. I hope that happens one day. <laughs> <laughs> all right work on it you just know it's my it's my bedtime literally because i'm up doing the emails at four in the morning and oh, that's where i'm going to go but it was really right. fun thank, thank you so much. much thank you for inviting me okay nice nice talking to you bye-bye thanks <laughs>